the topic of today's lecture is, so this is again, chess ideas you must know. The topic of today's lecture is going to be the backward pawn. And we're not going to talk about, um, we're not going to talk about how sometimes it's okay to have an, a, an isolated pawn or a backward pawn. Uh, for right now, we're just going to look at the weaknesses behind these sort of pawn structures. So anyway, so today is all about the backward pawn, and we'll talk about it a little bit. And, uh, and then next week, you know, it'll be some other topic. Uh, hopefully, we, you can just build upon them. And remember, you can always go back and rewatch the videos. So, okay, Nathan, yeah, definitely. So since, I, since we're committed to talking about players of the past on Tuesdays, we could certainly give a little bit of history on those players. Um, we could certainly do that, okay? And uh, Southern Run, I'm glad you like it. I think it makes a little, it makes some some sense to at least have some some bounds of what what there is I might talk about. So uh, yeah, so I, I'm glad you guys like that. So anyway, today is all about the backward pawn. Um, so first off, we, we need to see what a backward pawn is. We sort of need to define it. For those few of you who are who are, who are watching right now. Could one of you tell me what your basic definition of a backward pawn is? And uh, then we'll get going on some games. I've got um, a very historical game, a, a game of the past that a lot of people know. I've got a modern game um, from very strong players. And then I've got one of my own games. So um, you'll see hopefully three, three games today. Of, of the backward pawn weakness. Okay, so Wilsonator says the pawn at the end of the chain that cannot be defended by another pawn. Um, sort of, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting, that's, a, that's an interesting way to describe it. Okay, uh, Nathan says the bottom of the pawn chain may be hanging. Um, sort of, I get where you guys are going with it. You're, you're, you're halfway right. So, a pawn that cannot be defended by another pawn and it can't push safely, says AK Grandmaster. That's pretty much what it is. Southern run, yep, you, you, you're you pretty much there. A pawn that can't can't advance safely is considered a backward pawn. So you guys are good. Hey Nick, welcome. Good to see you online. Sorry we can't, We it's unsafe for us to be together in person, but at least you can interact with me here online. And, um, Anch Chess says a pawn that is isolated, that is blocking development, not protected. So it's very long-winded um, explanation. So the pawn itself might not be isolated. The key distinguishing point of a of a backward pawn is that it cannot safely advance. And typically, these these pawns are on half open files. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And um, so. Welcome everyone. Nick, welcome. Michael, welcome. Okay, Southern Run. Michael, putting names, putting names to to everyone. Nathan, Nathan J. Conklin is the easy one. So, all right. So let's have a look. So we'll start off with the the, the historical game, right? So we'll start off with a key game in chess that sort of really magnifies the this backward pawn concept, and so. Who better than a game of the Akiba Rubenstein legend, Akiba Rubenstein playing the white pieces here versus George Salway. Okay, so the game began d4, which is a fine first move, and d5. So we have a queen's pawn game right now. So a lot of players today are going like bishop to f4, but that would have been very rare um, in the early 1900s. So... Most players played the queen's gambit, and black played e6. So, of course, this is the queen's gambit. Black could take this pawn, but you can't really keep that pawn, so most players decide to just solidify their, their center by protecting the pawn with a pawn. Okay, so that's fine. So, Rubenstein developed knight to c3. It's a very good developing move, which pressures the center, so you can't really you can't really frown upon that move. 
Sao Wei played c5. This is known as the Terash defense after Siegbert Terash. So it's it looks sort of like black is playing the French defense against d4. Okay, but what black is trying to do is really just pressure white center as much as possible. So um, white made a capture on d5, which is, I mean, it eliminates some of the tension, but there's also a fundamental point here. So even though when black captures back, that frees his white squared bishop to come out into the game, the disadvantage for black is that this pawn can no longer be protected by its pawns and thus can become isolated. So with a pawn exchange, either by black or by white, this pawn could become isolated. Now, that isn't the topic of our lesson today. The topic of our lesson today is backward pawn, but it's still important to know some of uh, these terms and, and some of the ideas behind these openings. So, okay. White played knight f3, which today is still a very standard way to play against this opening. Knight f6, a perfectly fine move. And then, so this is like the beginning of the Terash defense. And to this day, the main move here is g3. And anyone want to take a guess what this variation of the Terash defense is called? And White's idea is pretty clear. White wants to fianchetto the bishop. And he can indirectly attack this pawn on d5, which is destined to become slightly weak because it cannot be protected by pawns. So anyone want to take a guess on what this variation of the Terash defense is called? And it's, it's on your screen. So go ahead and take a guess. So what we're looking for is the name of this variation that white is playing in, against black's Terash defense where he fianchettos and attacks. Yep, exactly, Southern Run. And Nathan, yep, right on your screen, right in your face, right? The Rubenstein variation, yep. And um, I'm not sure how often Rubenstein played this, but it just so happens to be that he's playing it in this game. So the Rubenstein variation. So I guess back then it wasn't really called the Rubenstein variation, it was just some opening. But players started to realize this was an effective setup against this pawn structure because white's targeting that weak pawn. All right. Welcome, dead man game. Welcome back. All right. So black developed sensibly with knight c6. White fianchettoed the bishop as planned. Now here, black committed this trade on d4, which most players would not do uh, now. Um, so self-isolating his d-pawn, so doing it without provocation. So most players here would play a move like bishop to e7, and then castle or close the center somewhat with the move c4. But okay, Salway played takes, white captured back, nothing crazy here. The knight is of course protected by the queen, so we've got that covered. And then played the move queen b6, very much like a French defense. Okay, so the problem is that playing it in this manner is not the most effective. Notice that the center is very open. And so moving your queen out to pressure the center when the center is open like that, it's probably going to cost you some tempi later in the game with your queen exposed. Okay, so um, white committed a trade here. Black wanted to reinforce his center. And so this pawn isn't isolated anymore, but you may see where the backward pawn, which is the theme of our, le of our lecture today, is uh, becoming available for white to target. So r right now, which is the backward pawn, or, or, or let's just say, which is the pawn that white hopes to make backward, right? And hopes to not allow to safely advance? That's right, Nathan, the C, the C pawn, okay? The nice thing about the C6 pawn is it's on a half open file, 
So yeah, we have pieces there right now, but we can try to get our pieces over there to attack this backward pawn. All right, so, but first things first, white needs to castle. And this is a strong move. And I, and I have to be honest, like, black needs to quickly castle too. Because that backward pawn, which is a strategic idea, may not matter if white can blast open the center with pawn to e4 and get at black's king that's still stuck in the middle. So strategic ideas go out of the window if you break the fundamentals of the game, like not, not castling quickly and getting your king out of the middle. So white would love to play the move e4 and blast the center open if black isn't going to castle. But black played smart. He played bishop to e7. I think that white could go e4 here and open the game. And I think that would be a fine move for white. But Rubenstein, a great strategic player, just a great player overall, he was really keen on taking advantage of this pawn weakness. So the two things that constitute a backward pawn weakness is that the pawn cannot safely advance, which is not exactly true at this present time. The pawn could safely advance itself, but then that would leave the pawn on d5 unprotected. So the, that's the first thing, is that the pawn cannot safely advance. And the second thing is that the backward pawns are often targets on the semi-open or half-open file. So white has a half-open file on the C file to go after this pawn on C6. All right. So now here's, here's a totally separate issue, but it's related to pawn weaknesses. If your opponent has a pawn weakness, one thing that you definitely want to do is fix the pawn weakness. So in other words, stop, keep, keep that pawn weakness from going away. Stop the pawn from moving. So what could white do and what did he do to try to fix this pawn on the c6 square? So again, it can't really advance right now because that would leave the pawn on d5 way underprotected. But in general, if if Rubenstein is going after this C pawn, then he'd like to stop it from moving because it is on the open file, so it is backwards pawn. And at some in, with some piece configuration, he'd like to develop and target this pawn. So in general, on chess, B4 would not be a bad move. That would be a good move. Unfortunately, here, it gives away a pawn, and I don't think it's really justified. It's interesting, but I don't think it's justified. So that would attempt to fix it, but we don't really have time to do that. My beef with the move a3 is that you may be forming your own backward pawn if you do that. So I may be able to play the move a5, stopping your b4 pawn advance, and then attack you down the b file. Okay? AK Grandmaster, Queen A4. Okay, so Queen A4 pins it. We're going we're gonna to guess that Black is going to get out of the center. And so it's not the Queen we want. Okay, Nathan, I like your idea, Nathan. So as noted earlier, this Queen is exposed to a lot of different attacks. The Queen is exposed to a Bishop E3 attack, a Knight A4 attack. And we would like to attack this square... A lot of different ways stop this pawn from advancing and then of course get our rook to that half open file so that we can actually attack that pawn weakness so indeed nathan good good job knight to a4 uh white would like to play bishop to e3 which also attacks this square and the queen but okay he doesn't want to lose his pawn on b2 so knight a4 was a good starting move Good job, Nathan, and, and Wilsonator. Good job. So the knight attacks the queen, and the knight also happens to protect the pawn on b2, which allows the bishop free to access this square. And then finally, the rook can get to the c file and actually start attacking the pawn. So as noted, our sort of first step in this process is fixing the weakness, stopping it from moving. Right? Then the next step is to actually attack it. Because right? it's all for nothing if we can't actually attack it in some constructive way. So, very good, Nathan. So, 
black played queen to b5. And Rubenstein was persistent. So first, so he knows he wants to bring this rook to the c file to attack the backward pawn. But he also wants to ensure that this outpost square on c5 can be utilized for his pieces. And he knows that if he blockades that square and stops the pawn from moving, he can also plant his pieces on those weak squares. Okay, so Rubenstein played bishop to e3, which is a great move. I mean, it develops a piece, it eyes this important c5 square, and it prepares to bring the rook over. So all those pieces are, are attacking this square, but finally, when the rook gets to the c file, we'll actually get to attack this backward pawn. Okay, hey, Tiger Ninja, welcome. Okay, I see we're starting to pick up some steam here. So hopefully we got to get we got to get more people in the chat. So I I really hate talking to myself. So if you guys want to engage me, just like definitely type it in the chat because I think there's only about a five or six second delay. So I'd love to to hear your thoughts. But hopefully I'm explaining things okay for you here. So uh, anyway, so bishop to e3, eyeing this square and preparing the rook over to attack the backward pawn. So black needs to castle, so he castled. And then white played the move rook to c1, which is all part of the plan. So these good strategic ideas, like attacking down the half-open file, attacking the backward pawn, fixing the pawn in such a way as to not allow it to move and advance forward, this is all strategic. This is really good. It gives white some ideas of like, if you're in your own chess game and you're like, what am I supposed to do? Knowing these ideas, can can be very powerful. It gives you something to think about. It gives you a plan. And in chess, it's it's the plans that matter. Hi Penelope, welcome. You watching too? All right. So Black played actively here, which I think is a good move. He played bishop to g4. And he needs to develop and he's being annoying. Because, you know, should the queen want to move ever, I mean, the e-pawn is weak. And also, he's simply attacking the e-pawn. So he's being annoying. Hey, Ans Chess. Yeah, you could huddle up with bishop to d7, followed by rook to c8 just to guard. But I'm going to plan a piece on that, c that c5 square, and I'm going to render your pieces pretty passive if you do that. So in these type of positions, the passive defense doesn't usually work. So bishop to g4 and pawn to f3. Uh, that move was not obligatory. He didn't have to play pawn f3, but he, he made good use of it later in the game. So we're not going to frown upon that move. It's certainly not a bad move. Another possibility would have been to play rook to e1 to guard this pawn. But I like the depth of... Rubenstein's play here. So you played f3. The bishop retreated, of course. Now, this is an outpost square because it cannot be attacked by any pawns. And so that's one positive thing for white. He's got this nice square for his pieces. He's got a choice of which piece to put there. And of course, we also want to attack this backward pawn. Okay. So in this situation, black has a good bishop and black has a bad bishop, okay? So can you in the chat go ahead and tell me which one is the theoretically good bishop and which one is the bad bishop? Oh, thanks, Coach Grant. Yeah, I shaved down today, so I do look a little bit younger and I got a shorter haircut because they don't let us get haircuts anymore for about a month. So I thought, let me not look too crazy, especially if I'm going to do streams. You know, I, got, I can't look too, too crazy. And uh, hey, Arnav, welcome. Pawn Storm Trooper, welcome. Yeah, the dark squared bishop is the good bishop. Yes, exactly, guys. The bishop on e7 is the, is the good one. And that's mainly just because it's not blocked by the center pawns. Okay? So the bishop on e6 is blocked by these center pawns, so its mobility is limited. Whereas the bishop on e7 doesn't really do much right now, but 
Okay. It is relatively... Yeah, exactly, guys. So the light square bishop is the bad one, and the dark square bishop is the more powerful one as it's sort of free to move along the diagonal. Okay? So the topic of this lecture is backward pawns. We've got a backward pawn here. In front of this backward pawn, we've got an outpost square for our pieces. And so white is placed really nicely here so far. But that doesn't mean like white's going to win the game, but white is doing the right things. So having said that, we know that this bishop on e7 is the, is the good bishop. So what do you think white's next move is, which builds on his strong squares along the c file, but also attempts to get rid of black's good pieces, which is another part of chess, of course, is when you trade, make, a, make trades that are beneficial for you. Get rid of your opponent's good pieces. So what do you think Rubenstein played to use the strong squares that he's earned from his strong strategic play, but also get rid of Black's good pieces all at the same time? All right, I see some really good strategic players uh, following this very nicely, okay? Bishop to c5, exactly. That's what, that's what he played. And to me, this makes a lot of sense because it doesn't win the game, but from, the, from a human standpoint, it makes sense because you're trading off your, their good bishop, okay? And you'd like to occupy this square with your pieces, maybe your rooks, maybe you'd like to double up or triple up, but you can't really do that. So you're gonna get rid of the dark squared bishop first. So good job, everyone that said bishop to c5. Nick, good job. Hey, hey, live for chess. Welcome. Hope everything's safe over there in the UK. It's a late night uh, educational stream today. But welcome, I hope you enjoy. And so, yeah, so basically we wanna trade these dark squared bishops off because we wanna trade off black's good pieces. By doing this, we're not getting rid of the backward pawn weakness that black has. So this doesn't, this doesn't, this is not a negative thing for white in it by any means, okay? So, all right, black defended his bishop. He certainly didn't want to trade for free and sort of allow this rook to come in with tempo, which would then allow white to really pile drive the c-pawn. So he decided, okay, Let's go ahead and play rook to e8. And now, of course, white could trade. But he probably didn't want to rush to doing that because that might offer black additional, additional defense to the c-pawn. So he played a very deep idea, Rubenstein did. And I'm not going to really ask you to find this, but I'll give you some hints and then maybe you can find it. So... In long term, the C-pawn is a, is a weakness that we'd like to attack. And we'd really like to load up on that weakness by attacking down the C-file. So we'd like to maybe double our pieces or triple our pieces on the C-file to attack the backward pawn weakness. And so how, how did Rubenstein not justify, but how did he make this F3 move from earlier look even wiser. What did he play here? Well, dead man game, he didn't want to go f4 because then that opens up, that reopens up some squares for black. So he likes that these pawns control black squares. Yeah, you're being too aggressive, I think. Remember, we'd like to attack this c pawn by loading up. So it's a very deep idea from White's standpoint on how he used this move to double up on the C-file and go after that back rank weakness. Guys, E4, the problem with E4 is, I was just talking trash about this bishop, but if you allow that pawn exchange, then that bishop opens up. So don't, what they call in chess, change the nature of the position, which means that you alter the pawn structure where things become totally different. Rubenstein didn't want that. Rubenstein had a static advantage of backward pawn, passive bishop. So he didn't go bonkers like that. He didn't go crazy with 
with these attacking ideas. He just wants to load up on this backward pawn. He's got this outpost square on c5, which he's blockading this pawn. He's using it for his pieces, which stifles black play. So, so, yeah. So, what did Rubenstein play to get his pieces over to the c-file? Fear Z, how do you record your chess screen but not the chess.com page? Oh, yeah, like that's... um. It's just a screen capture where you where you just eliminate a lot of the other stuff that you don't want people to see. So remember guys, it has everything to do with this pawn on F3. So how how did Rubenstein justify this pawn on F3 and use it for the good? And it indirectly helps him get to the C file. So it's like a riddle. Like this move helps us get to the C file? How in the world? Really deep play by Rubenstein. All right, so see all sorts of moves. Queen C2 is okay, but you don't really want to lead on this file with your queen. You'd like to lead with your rooks so that you could actually attack. Arna, very good. Rook F2. What a deep idea, right? So he wants to go Rook F2 e3 and then bring the rook over to c2 because he figures well i don't want my queen to lead on this battery and then even if my queen leads it's hard to get this rook over so i'll leave my queen here i'll save myself the time and i'll play pawn up to e3 and then rook over to f2 so that i can pressure the c file so that's indeed what happened so knight to d7 black played he really he was really feeling uncomfortable with his blockade here. So white went ahead and committed the, the good trade of the elimination of black's active bishop. Black, of course, took back. And now we don't want this pawn to advance. We don't want this pawn to advance. And the nice thing about rook f2 is it guards this. So let's... Let's uh, try to figure out what Rubenstein played here. He wants to stop this pawn advance because this backward pawn is only backward as long as it can't safely advance. And so the theme of this lecture is backward pawn, so we can't really allow this. So what do we do? Okay, pawn stormtrooper, very good. I see a lot of players wanting to go e e4, but that... Again, that changes everything because we could have a capture and that would open up the bishop. That would allow black's pieces into the game. And it's not like white's king is totally safe with these pawn moves around. So I wouldn't want to open the game. I would want to further attack and pressure this weakness. I'd love to go knight c5, but unfortunately we don't have enough attack there. So I see... Rook c5, yeah, unfortunately, not enough attack because black is threatening that. e3, not great because that does allow the move c5, so your rook isn't there in time to stop c5. Yeah, Erwin Al, yep. And I saw another one, Pawn Storm Trooper, AK Grandmaster, Queen to d4. A strong centralizing move, which keeps the protection of the knight focuses on not allowing that pawn to advance which keeps the knight at bay which keeps black space limited so yes good job everyone yep pawn sacrifice excellent brook awesome yeah queen to d4 so black went rook to e8 he's hoping to connect his rooks and bring them over here for both attack and defense white played the strong move bishop to f1 he realized that he's going to go e3, and he's going to bring his rook over here. So his bishop along this diagonal isn't as effective as it might be along this diagonal. So bishop f1 was a deep but strong move by Rubinstein. Rook e to c8. Okay. White played the move pawn e3, which allows c5, but there's an attack on the queen as well. So we have to be careful. So queen goes back to b7 
And now finally, white gets this knight off of the rim and knight to c5. Really planting, which stopping this pawn from advancing. It's sort of like the old Nimzovich idea, which was that when you're blockading the isolated pawn, that you should physically blockade it, not just blockade it in such a way where you're attacking it a million times like here. But Nimzovich said the best way to blockade is to physically blockade. So this pawn can physically not move, can legally not move. Okay, so that's the best blockade. All right, great. So black traded, white traded, and this is nice because we keep the blockade against this backward pawn. It's a fixed weakness. This rook is coming over, and Rubenstein plays the rest of the game very well. And black never really had any counterplay. Everything Rubenstein does here is logical, straightforward, and very strong. So rook to c7 is what Salwe played. I mean, he's, he knows that the attack is coming here. So white keeps, keeps loading up on the file. So rook c2, queen b6. And now the purpose of this is he would like some control of the squares over here. But after queen b6, Rubenstein played a very strong move here, further securing his pieces and his space advantage on the queen side. What did Rubenstein play? Hey, dead man game. Yeah, Rubenstein won, not because he's Rubenstein, but because he really just played a great game here. So... What did white play here to further fix, both secure and cement his pieces into the queen side, but also secure some square? The kid, yep. B4, good move. That's a new name. The kid, welcome. Is this your first time in on the stream? I mean, we're pretty new, so it wouldn't surprise me, but welcome anyway. So B4, awesome everyone. Yep, B4. And B4, protects the, the rook, which doesn't necessarily need protection, but it also stops various pawn breaks as well. Okay? And the, because of the pin down the C file against this backward pawn, we may even be able to play the move pawn to B5, attacking the pin piece. So B4 is a very useful move for a lot of different reasons. It secures all the pieces and the squares on the queen side, but it also, it's an additional attacking unit against that backward pawn on c6. All right, pawn a6, he wants to stop the move b5. So white played another good move here. So he played rook a5, offering the queen trade. So he's offering the queen trade because he knows that these pawns are for pickings if the queens come off. For example, queen takes queen, pawn takes queen, and yeah, the queens are off the board, but it, the, the weaknesses here are even better seen because we've got an attack on the A pawn, we've got an easy attack on the C pawn, and these are fixed targets, and you can say sayonara. I mean, these pawns are on the dark squares, and this bishop is totally whiffing. I mean, it's not even whiffing. It's not even up to bat. It's just sort of blocked. Okay? So, anyway. So, queen trade didn't happen. He played rook to b8. He said, you trade queens with me. I'll at least try to get my rook in a more active place. White just said, no. a3. I'm not going to let you get active. You want me, Rubenstein's saying, you want me to take here. Okay, and then you want to get active by taking my b-pawn and making things chaotic. But as we talked about earlier, when your opponent has these static weaknesses that aren't going anywhere, you don't have to do that. Just relax. Keep everything the same. If the, guy, if the guy's getting totally outplayed and he's got all these weaknesses, why would you allow him to change the position in any way? He's a sitting duck. And so are these pawns and so are his pieces. So he says, and again, we don't care about this trade. You want to trade? That pawn's gone for sure. That one's probably gone too. And I mean, that's going to be all she wrote there. So, all right. 
so in the game, rook a7 happened to guard this pawn, which is now under attack. Remember, before, when black played rook to b8, if white took this pawn, black would take this one. But after the move a3, guarding the pawn, now this one is under attack. So rook a7, guarding the pawn, and now white had a very simple but nice tactic which won a pawn. So does anyone see it? Go ahead and type it in the chat. <clears throat> so black tried to guard his pawn, the one on a6, but he left another one hanging due to tactics. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Rook takes c6, winning a pawn, and really winning the game. So finally, that backward pawn, which was a weakness for a large part of the game, finally fell um, just due to the buildup, due to the strategic buildup that white has, has done here. So queen takes c6 happened, and of course the purpose of this is that there's a attack on the a7 rook, which is going to be seen in the game. If black doesn't take the rook and trades queens, white has effectively won a pawn and looks like he's going to win another one. Okay, and you just can't be down this much material against, against your opponents. It's too much. So, after rook takes c6, black took it. Rubenstein took the rook on a7. And again, the rook on b8 is hanging, the pawn on a6 is hanging over and over and over. Yeah, the queen has the open file, but we can stuff that open file on the next turn. So you can't use that open file right now because your rook is hanging. And when you guard your rook, I can come back and make sure you don't use that open file. Dead man game. So... A good eye, but not really, because you're not using that file. Rubenstein says, nope, you're not using that file. I wouldn't have cashed in so quickly if I thought you were going to gain that easy of a counterplay. So rook a8 happened. He's crossing his fingers that the guy goes like queen e7 or something like that, so that he could come down here and start harassing these weaknesses. But Rubenstein says, no, queen c5. I'm cutting out all of that counterplay. You don't have a chance. You're not using this file. I'm winning a pawn. I already won a pawn. This is another one that's got to be catered to. The D pawn is now isolated and weak. So Rubenstein's strategic play has yielded him a pawn and an enduring advantage in position. So queen b7 voids the queen trade. Rubenstein prepares his king for the end game with king f2, bringing the king closer to the center. With all the, with all the infiltration squares blocked, he's not concerned. Pawn to h5. Okay. Uh, here's a good question. Why didn't black play rook c8? Challenging the file. Because, I mean, Rubenstein didn't have to allow that. But why did he allow that? If good players allow the move like rook c8 gaining control of the file, they've usually got something up their sleeve. So what was Rubenstein going to play here? Awesome, Arnav. Good job, Anch. Yep. Dead man game, yeah. Bishop takes a6. And this leads to mass trading where white is up material. A lot of material. So rook takes c5 because I'm skewering you. Skewering you. So if you take my queen, I take yours. If you come down here for a check, it's not going to do you much. I'll move out of the way. And then you've got to deal with the fact that your back rank's weak and I've got two extra pawns. So anyway, he didn't want to go in for that, which is logical. So he played h5. White went bishop to e2. Not concerned about rook c8 for the same reason. Pawn g6, queen d6, I like this move. 
So he shored up his seventh rank from any attacks, just in case he's temporarily giving away this, or maybe the queen comes in, and he's, this is a clearance move, getting his queen off of c5 so that his rook can come over and infiltrate. So he's creeping into black's position, and mind you, he's already up a pawn, and queen d6, speaking of which, adds a third attacker to the pawn on a6. So you would not want to be black here, promise you. This is where, in a real tournament, you'd be like sliding out of your chair or covering your face. And inevitably, this is when everyone would come over to watch your masterpiece. So you would not want to be black here, okay, against anyone, all right? Queen c8, rook c5, gaining control of the file. And not surprisingly, the game ends very soon. h4, a5, and he didn't, even, he didn't even take this. He said, let's go ahead and play rook c7 and get that pawn rolling down the board. I don't want this. Let's, let's get this pass pawn going. Yeah, I know, Wilson. Yeah, it's, it's been there, done that, been there, continue to do that. It's just the way it, just, just the way it goes in chess, unfortunately. So it's, you know, it's everyone comes over to the game, you know, you're, you're, you're ready to resign, but then 30 people come over to watch your masterpiece. And uh, it's a sad day in the neighborhood, emotionally, okay? But that's what Black is facing here. So anyway, after a few moves, A4, some desperate moves, B6. I mean, Black is just playing any, any move he can legally find at this point. And then B7, resign. So the threat is cute. The threat is Rook C8, which is, of course, a basic fork, which is covered by the bishop, but then there's also a discovery on the queen. So this part of the game was not, I mean, I breezed through this part of the game. It wasn't as deep as some of the middle game stuff. Thank you, Southern Run. Thank you, Michael. So basically, we'll, we'll do a very quick recap of the game. So today is all about backwards pawns. We, there were some other weaknesses there too, but, but mainly backward pawn. So the backward pawn was created here. And so then Rubenstein had this idea of playing knight a4, bishop to e3, rook c1, which blockades the pawn from moving and also attacks the pawn, which is the way you're supposed to do it, blockade and attack. And so pretty much, that's exactly what happened. And there were some deep moves, like I like the move rook f2, using the pawn on f3 to double up on the c-file. And then, yeah, and basically we white kept the blockade of that c of that c5 square and then after a slow build up slowly stripping down black of his defenses eventually white hit him with the tactic rook takes cc a uh, rook takes c6 with a winning advantage and that's not a surprising way that chess goes i mean that's a very normal way especially at a higher level that's the way a normal chess game will go a player sort of outdoes the other in in a strategic standpoint, but the other one's like still clinging on, you know, like oh please, please, you know, I have a chance. But you um, the problem is that inevitably when you're strategically inferior in like in position, that the tactics are just going to hit you, and you're trying you're dodging bullets, you're dodging, you're trying to stay alive, but. The tactics are going to hit you when your position sucks. I mean, that's just that's just the way chess works. And you play enough strong players, you know, you know, it, it, pending a miracle, you basically just know your you know your, your, your the material might be even, but when you can't move any of your pieces and you're sitting there with eight hundred weaknesses, you know your death is in the future, in the near future. Okay, so anyway. I hope you enjoyed that classic game. It took longer than I thought, but I hope uh, that was a beneficial analysis for you because there were a lot of good maneuvers in that game too that weren't even uh, weren't even related 
to um, backward pawns specifically, but just strong positional maneuvers. All right. Um, I have two more games for you. So let's let's just take it one at a time because technically the lecture is supposed to end at 730. And our viewership is only around 25 or 30. If we had a lot more viewership than that, I might go beyond my 730. But at, at 25 to 30 viewers, I'm not sure who's, who's um, what everyone's doing. Everyone must be partying tonight. But I thought, I thought everyone was supposed to be home by 5 o'clock, at least the locals. So, um, but anyway... So we'll see how we'll see how things go after the next game, and then we'll we'll see whether it's good for us to go through the third game, or maybe I can just refer to the third game and you can um, review it on your own. Okay, but the the next game you will not find in a database because it's one of my own games that was not played on uh, a live board or was not recorded. Um, for the databases. So this one, I have games in the database. This is not one of them. Okay, let me flip the lights on. It's getting a little dark here, so I don't know if that helps. So, all right. So I, try, I went back in history and I tried to find a classic game. So that one I showed you, Rubenstein's a classic game for the uh, backward pawn. We take these ideas from the famous players of the past, and we try to use them in our own games, in our own very unique games. The games aren't really, you know, they're never really the same. So we have to just see the patterns and ideas and then try to incorporate them in our own games, okay? So I'm gonna flip the board here. In this particular game, I was playing black. And at this time, I was a master. As you can see, I was a 2260 player. My peak rating is 2390. Um, but at this time, this is I, I just made master, and once I got that out of my head, um, I was able to sort of gain some additional points because there was no there was no psychological road block for me, and I was and I was on a stretch of really good tournaments. I was playing really well, and uh, I think this game represents that. I was playing Will Mahan, who is uh, was a local expert, I think from the Asheboro, North Carolina area, Greensboro area. And uh, we played this tournament at the Greensboro Open, which I won um, that that time. And this was the last round, yeah. And so you can see the names of the players um, below the uh, chessboard. I mean, hopefully it's not cut off on your screen, but it looks okay on my screen. And uh, so I was playing black here against Will Mahan, who's an expert, twenty one, about twenty one forty uh, USCF at that time. This was two thousand and fifteen. So. We're still going to focus on backwards pawns, but that doesn't, and that does occur in this game. But we're also not going to neglect the other the other positive maneuvers and things, just like in the previous game. So we'll breeze through the opening. So my opponent played the move c4, the English opening, which is a perfectly fine move. I played the move e6, and he played knight c3, and I played d5, and then just taking some control of the center. And then he went d4, and now we're actually in a queen's gambit decline. So by transposition, it started as an English, but now we're in a queen's gambit opening. Okay, I played the move bishop to e7. He committed a trade here, which is a very popular way to play against the queen's gambit decline, the exchange variation. He played bishop to f4, developing. I went c6, reinforcing my pawn chain. He went e3. I went bishop to d6. Uh, this is, you know, shame on me for playing this. As it turns out, it's a theoretical move. Um, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to imitate my play. But one thing is, this bishop is often difficult to get out, and you always have to be worried about white coming down here and attacking this when you bring your light squared bishop out too early, and. So one interesting thing is the main line here is bishop to f5. And then white goes g4 to harass that bishop. And then the game gets very complicated, which you might say, well, don't you want that? And I sort of did, except for the fact that I didn't know the theory. So I was like, well, it's been a while since I've studied that theory, which is pretty deep. 
So I'll play a positional line, which has some theory, but maybe if it'll get to a position where it's not so forcing. So I played bishop to d6. The idea is I'm going to get this bishop out. Like if he stops me by going bishop to d3, I'm going to place my knight on e7, which supports my bishop to f5. All right, so he played knight e2. Not a huge fan of that move, but it makes sense if I trade. That invites his knight to the center, so I didn't do that. I developed with knight to e7 so that I could just develop as I had planned. He traded, I took. He went knight to f4, clearing the way for his development. I castled. He played bishop to d3. I wanted to get rid of my weak light squared bishop, which was the point of knight to e7, so I played bishop to f5. And this is all, you're thinking to yourself, where's the backward pawn and everything? I'm, so light, light notes to these moves, all right? Queen c2, we had a trade. Here he took with the queen. I thought he should take with the knight. And then from there, the knight has some positive squares in the center. But all right, he took with the queen. I developed. So now you can follow my play. Like, you can copy my play. I'm okay with that. I'm playing sensibly. Castle. Knight f6. Just advancing more toward the center. We'll see what, we'll see what white does. All right. So white played the move a3. So this is the first time I would say that I really had to make a decision on what I wanted to do. So a3, what does a3 do? So there's a plan in chess that we'll talk about on some other Thursday, which is ideas in chess you must know, which is the lecture of the Thursday lecture topic called the minority attack. Okay, And it happens indeed in this exact pawn structure called the Carlsbad pawn structure. Okay, So... The idea is that if white gets it his way, white will use this minority of pawns, this smaller group of pawns, to attack the, weak, the larger group of pawns to encourage exchanges to weaken the pawn chain. So when my, when my opponent played a3, well, I knew what he wanted to do. Anyone want to take a guess on what move... I played after the move a3, which is a prophylactic measure, at least a little bit, against what he wants to do. Very good, Arnav. Pawn a5. And, I, and I'm going to dead man game. Good job. Pawn a5. And it doesn't really stop it forever, but it's one of those decisions that you have to make. You know, white can try to do it anyway. And you know, then you argue that maybe after a trade, you can use the A file, okay? So I wanted to stop white from going B4, so I played A5. And I thought he was going to play rook to B1. Uh, and then, you know, the game would go on, but I was thinking I might go knight back to C8. And then when he goes b4, because the, c, the c4 square would become an outpost, I might be able to eventually maneuver my knight into that square. So I wasn't that concerned. But the move rook a to d1 surprised me because he gave up on this idea. He gave up on the minority attack idea, which was a surprising thing for me. Because usually when you start something, you try, and, and I, didn't, I didn't really stop it permanently. So I'm surprised he just totally shifted plans. Okay, so I went rook to e8 because I thought by him putting his rook here, to me, that was him telling me, I don't want to go for the minority attack anymore. I want to go for a center attack. So what center pawn break does white want to prepare here? And he sort of gave it away by playing rook to d1. Because he could have played rook to b1 going for the minority attack, finishing his plans. But he went rook to d1 instead. Yeah, Arnav. He wants to... He's playing for the pawn break e4. Yeah, the kid. Good job. Mm -hmm. He's playing for e4. But he's got some work to do before he can do that. Because first of all, if he goes e4, it hangs a knight. Okay, so... He can't even do it immediately. 
And this plan is really time consuming. So I said, well, you know, you're far ahead, you're far away from being able to play this. And uh, let's say this knight wasn't hanging. I'm not that concerned of e4 anyway, because when I trade, that's going to isolate this pawn. So he really needs to prepare e4 in a lot of different ways. He needs to go f3, followed by e4, but then he needs to move this knight away, and he probably needs to bring his rook over. So he's like four or five moves away from playing e4. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go rook to e8, and I'm going to place my rook on this, on this half-open file, okay? My opponent played the move rook to e1. Now it's sort of like... You can't even lie anymore about what you're trying to do. Because putting your rook on the not open file only suggests one thing. You think that that file is going to open. Okay? So I was thinking, huh, my pieces uh, are a little clumsy. I would say that the knight is good. The knight on f6 is good. Because it eyes the control of that square. But I started thinking, hmm, the knight on, the knight on e7 is not well placed. So I maneuvered it and I wanted to get it to a more positive square, a square where it could do more. I thought of playing knight to g6, but he was a lower rated opponent, so I wanted to avoid too much trading. I wanted to keep some artillery on the board, so to speak. So I didn't play knight to g6, so I'll go ahead and spare you that. But I wanted to maneuver this knight to a, to a better place. So I figured I have some time to maneuver because he's not ready to play e4. So I can spend some tempi positioning my pieces for the battle too. So what did I play? I'll let you guys uh, suggest in the chat. What did I play here? All right, Arnov says knight c8. All right, with a maneuver possible to a few different squares from there. All right. What else we got? Yep. Good. E7's ma, is that? Maybe, tell me who you are. Knight C8, Knight C8, Knight F5. I would love to go Knight F5. Unfortunately, Knight F5 is unprotected, but I, I would like to go Knight F5. Mm -hmm. But, okay. So I did go Knight to C8. And... Uh, I have some I, some options of where I'm going to go with the knight. So he played knight to a4. And I think he thought that I wanted to go knight to b6. But I didn't really want to go knight to b6. Because even if he left his knight here, I thought maybe after knight to b6, it's possible he could go b3 and block my knight out. So... After knight a4, oh, hey, welcome, welcome, I'm glad, yeah, exactly, exactly, well, I'm glad you have more time, and I hope this is entertaining for you, so, so he went knight a4, and he thought he was stopping knight to b6, but as it turns out, that's not really what I wanted to do, so, again, he's changing his mind too much. He was going for e4, now he's stopping me from doing things. And so he's, his pieces are, are starting to fall out of order. And they're not making sense. So I do want to improve this knight. And I want to I wanna bring the knight to a more influential square. At the same time, I do want to keep in mind what he may be doing. So he may be stopping my knight from going to b6. He may be wanting to come into c5. Um, I didn't play b6 because I wouldn't be lecturing about this if I did that because he would go and attack my backward pawn. Welcome, Eli. Yeah, I mean, the thing about, the thing about knight a7 and knight b5 is it's a long way to get to nowhere or to the square that I can get to a lot faster. So play a clearance tactic, not a tactic, but a clearance move which gets a piece out of the way so that you can improve a piece, a, a different piece. Hey, Nick, I don't want to go pawn to b5. It's, that's double-edged because that allows the knight into c5. 
Yeah, I don't. I, I wasn't ready to to give away my queen side like that. Yeah, Wilsonator has it. So something with the queen. So I went queen to d8 so that I can keep his knight at bay but give my knight the d6 square where I can influence the center and, and the c4 square. Yeah, okay, guys. Oh, uh, excellent, Brooke. A clearance move is where you move one piece off a square so that another one of your pieces can move it to move to that square. Elwyn, good job. Queen to d8. Yep. Got it, excellent, Brooke. Is that is that a fair explanation of a clearance move? It sort of sounds like what it is. Is that fair? So we move one piece off of a square so that another one of our pieces can utilize that same square. So my queen was not that effective on d6. And since since he wasn't preparing to go, since he wasn't preparing to go e4 with his knight over here, I'm in time to get my knight to the d6 square. All right, I hope that was a fair uh, explanation of a clearance move. So, queen c7 is, is fine too. Mm -hmm. Sentinel. Mm -hmm. um, so, queen c7 would have been a perfectly fine move as well. All right. So, my opponent played f3, and finally, finally, the topic of today's lecture backwards pawns. So the first game I showed you, Rubenstein Salwe, backward pawn. Giannato, you know, Mayhan Giannatos, finally backwards pawn. But, you know, he's he's he created a backwards pawn, which is which is guarded a gazillion different ways. But the thing is, I'm going to attack it a gazillion different ways, and unless I allow it to advance, I'm going to make that move look a little silly because I'm going to attack this weakness on e on e3. So I played knight to d6, which was what I had set out to do anyway. So basically, the knights are pinching the e4 square along with a lot of my other pieces. This knight is kept at bay because of the queen. And even though this knight could come into c5, I could get rid of it or do nothing about it because my knight conveniently guards b7. And in this Carl's bad pawn structure, the knight on d6 is one of the most effective squares because it guards the b pawn. Sorry, guys. I'm, it seems like I'm having trouble drawing arrows. And also attacks center squares. So the knight on d6 is better than the queen on d6, which is why I played that maneuver. My opponent played b3. He wanted to keep me out of c4, although I wasn't going to go there immediately because I didn't want to relinquish the control over e4. Bye, Michael. Thank you. Hey, Violet Cosmos. Yeah, the Carlsbad pawn structure is... I had mentioned it earlier, so maybe after the stream you could go back. I don't want to talk too much about it because it's sort of a deeper thing. Um, but we could have like a whole lecture on the Carlsbad. But keep tuning in on Thursday. Um, and maybe we'll talk about it as a topic one day. But I don't want to uh, talk about it too much here. But it's basically the... Yeah, so... So yeah, uh, yeah, it's seven thirty-seven. I'm I'm running over, but hopefully you guys are enjoying it. So I'll just I'll just stay on. I won't just end it right here. So my opponent played b three to keep me out of c four, and I wanted to pressure him down the e file. I wanted to pressure this backwards pawn. So I played rook e seven. I didn't want to lead with my queen since I'm never really going to take with my queen here. So, rook e7. My opponent played knight back to c3, realizing that his knight wasn't doing anything on the queen side anymore to prepare the move e4. I played the tempo gaining move queen b6, which attacks the pawn on b3. It indirectly pressures his king and this mini pawn chain here. So it's just a productive move. And of course, it allows the rook to the e8 square, where going after this backwards pawn. So my opponent played rook to b1. I doubled up on the file. Exactly, f3 was indeed a bad move. He created a pawn weakness for himself, 
he, and he still can't play e4. So it was just bad judgment from his standpoint. He played knight to h3. He played knight to h3. Oh, is my volume low? I, that's the first I'm hearing about it, um, Gari. No one has mentioned that my volume was low. Does every, is everyone else having problems with my volume, or is it just Gari? Maybe Gari needs to turn to turn up his volume. I don't know. Violet, no. Arnav, no. Gari, maybe it's maybe it's not me. It's you. Okay. So knight h three and g6 and I like the move g6 because uh, g6 allows my knight to get to the f5 square where I can continue attacking this weakness so yeah I think he's really getting pile drived here um, down the e-file and I'm really starting to attack this weakness so he went knight to a4. It's a sort of desperate move. He has to play something. This is coming. Okay, unless he's willing to go g4. Okay. And after the move queen to b5, I said, yeah, let's trade. If you trade with me, so you're first of all, you're attacking my queen. And if you trade with me, I'll take with the pawn, attacking your knight, and then I've still got all of the attack here. So I've fed, I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to, to eliminate some of the defense of this pawn. So my opponent played queen to d2. I went knight to f5, continuing to attack the backwards pawn. My opponent went knight to c3, attacking my queen. I just retreated. He now went knight to d1, Wilson, went knight to d1. And now I have a tactic. So what black to play and at least win some material, but winning this material also wins me um, an important uh, piece that's, that's keeping white together. So white to play, uh, sorry, black to play here. And finally take advantage of, and this reminds me of the Rubenstein position because black has outplayed white strategically but finally a tactic needs to take place to actually win something oh arnov you're far too kind a4 oh come on he's gonna he's gonna bypass that you're you're being too nice to the guy you gotta kill him yeah wilson knight to d4 mm -hmm. knight d1 blocks the cooperation of the rooks so i've got a pin on that backwards pawn. So I played knight takes d4. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not surprising that there's a there's a knockout there, that there's a there's a, a move that wins material because white's pieces are so poorly placed. Okay. So he played b4. I played knight back to f5 because I I won my pawn. And now I'd like to target this a lot of times. My opponent played rook to b3 to guard. I went knight to d6 because I saw that I might have the maneuver knight to c4, which not only attacks the queen, but also further attacks this. And so, you know, black is up a pawn and with a winning advantage. So it's a matter of time. So queen c3 he played. Now, at this time, I was taking lessons um, for chess. I mean, I was an expert when I started taking lessons. It was the first time in my life I had a private coach. I started taking lessons from Grandmaster Alexander Shabalov, many-time US champion, and uh, who I'm, very, I'm friends with to this day. Um, and I consider a great coach. Um, of the game and he mentioned something to me which I never really thought about even though I was a good player when I was taking lessons from him I never really thought about it but he was like the first thing that you should do when an opponent issues a threat is consider it ignoring it 
Okay, so my opponent's attacking my knight in such an elementary fashion that it's not like I'm not going to see it. And Arnov, I mean, king to g7, guarding my knight and moving into a pin, that is indeed a Dominique Myers move. Yes, he would teach me to do that. Dominique would teach me to move my king into a pin, okay? So, no, I didn't do that, okay? White is doing two things here, okay? White is guarding his rook so he can take my pawn. Because before, that pawn was not takeable. So he played queen to c3. And he's attacking my knight, and he's attacking my pawn now, because he's protecting his rook. Lynx, really good job. Lynx, very good. A4. Now, this is, a, this is more complicated than it seems, because he takes my knight, I take his rook, he takes another knight. That's two minor pieces for, for a rook. Normally, we're like, no, no, no. We're not doing that. But this pass pawn on b3 is very dangerous. So I had calculated. This is what happened. I had calculated up to here. I mean, in a little bit further. But I'm going to stop it here for you to figure it out. So what move did I play here? which ends the game due to white's overloaded pieces. And I was pretty proud of myself for, for finding this uh, over the board because it's a nice move. So I obviously want to break him down here. I want to break all that down. But he's, he's clinging, he's clinging to e3, oh please. So we got to get him out of there. So we have, to, we have to find a way to get him out of there. Okay, so, so I see uh, rook takes e3. I see pawn b2. Lynx says b2. Lynx has been on a roll today. He's been suggesting some good stuff. Wilsonator, yep. b2. That's Aaron Wilson, right? Welcome, Aaron. So b2. Yeah, b2, guys. You, the Arnav, Excel Brook, Lynx, Wilsonator. b2 is the move. That just crushes him because I'm threatening to promote if he takes or if he stops promotion by moving the knight, my my rook, oh, sorry, my rooks break down the e3 point along with my queen's attack. So he played knight takes b2. I played rook takes e3 and then he resigned. Oh, for you guys, that's not good, right? Because he resigned, and then, you know, like, that spoils it for you. But we're not going to, we're going to keep going. Okay, we're going to keep going for just a few moves, so you can see what the game might have turned out to be. All right? So, first of all, let's do easy first. You cannot take me here, because I take with check. And then I come to the back rank and deliver checkmate. So you guys are, I mean, you've suggested all the hard moves. Back rank checkmate is too easy for you. All right. So you're not, you know, that's too easy for you. So after rook takes e3, we have to dodge this attack. And then we have to try not to lose to a discovery. Okay. Yeah. So... We've got, so rook f1 is the most tenacious move, okay, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you could take, but you're not living, uh, as you know here. You're not living after this. I could take the knight and down material and down position. So rook f1... And most moves are good here, like rook b3, discover check, followed by capturing the knight. But there's a very powerful move here. So this is fine. And then after something like king to h1, 
Rook takes b2, and that would win for, that would certainly win for, for white. But to me, you know, I'd want to play some discovery like rook to e6, attacking the queen. But he has the move queen to c5. So the strongest move, as Gari sees, is queen to d4. And queen d4 attacks everything, keeps the attack on the king. It attacks the knight on b2. And now it actually threatens rook to e6 because the queen can't block the check anymore. So, well, what are you going to do? So he probably resigned on the notion that after rook f1, I could just go here and pick. And that's enough too because that's way more than enough. Uh, I'm up material. I'm up in the king's safety. I'm up like four, like four, two, three points of material. It's just way too much, and my pieces are active. So this end part was mainly tactical, and most games that happens. So you play some good strategy, and then at some point you have to calculate something. Okay, and so originally the topic of this lecture is backwards pawn. So originally. The weakness was created here. And then after some maneuvering of attacking that backwards pawn, it finally yielded a pawn due to a chess tactic. And it was reminding me a little bit of what um, Rubenstein did in the first game that I showed. So feel free to go back and, and observe that. Um, once we end today. And so, yeah, so, well, I know it's 750. I hope you, I hope you guys enjoyed the extra lecture. Obviously, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not offended if you have to go and we're going to end very soon. And so, yeah, good night, Nathan, and thank you for tuning in. Um, and so, for those of you who are watching, if you haven't followed our page yet I know there if you haven't followed our our chess center account please do so um, I can so our stream schedule is Monday through Thursday where Monday and Wednesday are more student oriented streams like for kids we've got the puzzle challenge and play the coach and then Tuesday and Thursday night are lectures like this so Tuesday night is players of the past uh, great players of the past who were not the world champions. So last Tuesday, we talked about Ellis Casas. Today is ideas in chess you have to know. So that is um, today's lecture was backwards pawn. I mean, it could be a variety of things. It could be the minority attack. It could be hanging pawns. It could be isolated pawns. There's so much in chess to talk about. But every Thursday, there will be some theme. So if you haven't liked us, or subscribe to us or followed us, please do that. Thank you guys for tuning.